Okay class, I am back with part two of our chapter nine video lecture where we're going to focus on retirement plans. Keep in mind that our textbook doesn't have all the details for every situation, but you need to read the textbook to learn the basic rules and exceptions. And also re really good is the examples they give after each set of instructions. And there's lots of terminology, lots of rules. So before we take a look at the slides here in this part two video lecture, let's have an overview about retirement plans. So let's say that this circle here is retirement plans in general. So you hear a lot about the different types of retirement plans, like a pension or a profit sharing plan or maybe a 401k, which is a variation of a um, profit sharing plan, or an IRA, or employee stop option plan, or for self-employed or partner, something called a KEO plan or HR10 plan. There's a different um, set of rules for each of this under the Internal Revenue Code for how much money you can put in, and how much money you can take out the money that you put into a retirement plan is called a contribution. You know, in my lectures, I don't write too nicely. The reason why is I'm using a stylus and the, my screen is upright, not laying flat down on, on the table. So I'm really drawing with just like two fingers. Um, anyway, the money coming in to the retirement plan is called a contribution or sometimes called funding. And as an employee, hopefully, you would like the money coming in paid by the employer who you work for. Typically, retirement plans are related to a taxpayer's employment. So here is the employer. And as an employee, I want my employer to put all of the money required here into the retirement plan. Sometimes we call this a non-contributory plan where the employee puts in nothing. The employer puts in everything. But more and more, Employers are now requiring employees to help fund, here's the employee, help fund the contributions. So, you know that weekly or semi-weekly paycheck you get from the employer? Maybe some of that is going to be diverted out to help fund the retirement plan. So in the case of the employer, the contribution is going to be immediately deductible, saving them taxes on the employer's tax return. Now, the amount being diverted by the, from the employee's pay could be a deduction, reducing the salary, the taxable salary, which is good. Or maybe it could be non-deductible. The employee, even though they don't see the money right away, still has to pay taxes on this non-deductible contribution. Keeping in mind, when the employee does retire and takes out the money, it eventually will come back, right? Hopefully, our employee here will be retired, not receiving this salary, so thus in a lower tax bracket and this retirement income, we call this a distribution, will come back to our uh, taxpayer, either as fully taxable, if in this case, the employee had a deduction or reduction of the taxable salary or partially non-taxable. Uh, you see this non-deductible contribution by the employee? It will eventually come back non-taxable. And the employer's contribution, all of the earnings here as it's being distributed will be taxable. So it kind of balances out in the long run, whether it's deductible or non-deductible uh, contributory plan of the employee. Okay, so we're going to learn the rules about contributing, uh, distributions, different types of plans. Here's our sponsor, employee sponsored. Now, an employee can also set up their own plan. Typically, this would be an IRA plan, a contribution to an IRA. I should have, you know, here is the IRA, and a distribution of the IRA. The person that handles the administration of the retirement plan is called a trustee. And they in turn may have reporting requirements, filing tax forms with the government. 
Most times the forms are called uh, Form 5500. Okay, very specialized area of taxation. But for most of us, we're interested in this type of transactions here, contributions, and this type of transaction here, distributions from the retirement plan. So let's take a look at some terminology. To be a qualified retirement plan, so get these benefits of contributing and distributions, uh, you have to follow the IRS rules. The IRS rule says you cannot so-called discriminate in the favor of the owners or highly compensated employees of the business. So we have plans typically for corporate type pension, profit sharing, including 401k plans. Of course, you have to be a corporation in order to have a stock plan. Now, if your business is not incorporated, but a sole proprietorship or partnership, so-called self-employed um, businesses, then there's other types of plans you can set up. Something called a HR10 or KEO plan, a SEP or SIMPLE plans. Even 401s can be used by a self-employed where you have just one owner working for the business. Now, in the case of a um, unincorporated business um, retirement plan, you have to make sure, again, you're not discriminating in the favor of the, the taxpayer owner. Yeah, You have to cover employees with something comparable. And um, it's possible to have unqualified plans where you do discriminate in the favor of highly paid executives or maybe pos uh, owner workers yeah but then you won't have all of the, the benefits we've we're going to be talking about in this slideshow there's two ways of determining how much you're supposed to put into contribute into a retirement plan so let's say here's our retirement plan again. And what we're talking about in this slide is how much to contribute, how much is required to contribute into the plan. The easiest of these two methods listed here is called defined contribution, where you take pretty much a, a percentage of the employee's pay, and that's how much you contribute. So maybe the, the um, contract says we want to contribute 5% of everybody's pay into their retirement account with our retirement plan. That's pretty much set. And then the trustee will invest it. Hopefully it grows really big. And then whatever is in that employee's account at the time they retire is how much they can take out, distribute. No more, no less than that. Okay, but there was a formula to determine here how much to contribute as a percentage of the employee's pay. Okay, that's called defined contribution. And then the other method mentioned here called defined benefit, you're still trying to figure out how much to contribute, but you look at the other end here, the benefit the employees projected to get at the time they retire. So basically there's some type of formula, formula to figure out how much they're gonna take out. So a typical one would be for every year our employee works for our company, we're going to give them 2% of their average pay uh, for uh, when they do retire. So if they work for us for, for 10 years, we're going to give them 20% of their pay every year for the rest of their life. Or if they work for us for, for 40 years, we're going to give them 80% of their pay for the rest of their life. Now 80% of not maybe just the average for their whole work life, but maybe the, the so-called high, high five um, years. So you average out the highest five years of the employee pay, and you're gonna take 80% of that if they work for you four years, if you're gonna give them a 2% um, retirement benefit each year. So now you're gonna estimate how much you have to put in based upon this expectation that the employee is gonna receive and you're doing this for all your employees. And you don't know how long they're going to live. The longer they live, the more you're going to have to take out, right? Or the shorter they live, the less you take out. Or you don't even know how long they're going to be working right now for the rest of their work life. So all of this is estimated by somebody called an actuary. 
and based upon how much you think you can invest here and make a profit in your retirement plan will determine how much right now each year the employer has to contribute into the retirement plan again both methods here are trying to calculate how much to contribute and sometimes they do not contribute enough to fund this future benefit so especially for governments you hear the term unfunded pension and health benefit liability in other words they're not putting enough right now into the retirement plan to fund the future retirement of their employees their current employees who are still working and not retired okay so that's uh, some terminology here versus that was that that was pension plans be it contributory where employee puts in also and non-contributory funded fully by the employer versus a profit sharing plan and the most common one you hear a lot is a 401k plan and generally it implies that the employee is going to contribute part of their paycheck into the plan something comparable to a 401k plan that applies to private businesses or or, or um, corporations is um, 403b this would be for government workers or nonprofit organizations and 457 these are all code sections that provide for this type of retirement plans okay so 401k 43b 457 very comparable to each other considered to be profit sharing what makes it the uh, the term profit sharing applicable is maybe if the company is profitable they'll contribute more into the plan or if they're kind of have less profits less into the plan or nothing into the plan okay so but the intent is to have the employer contribute something so typically the employer especially in 401k plans will say for every two dollars the employee puts into the plan the employer will match it with a one dollar so the total would be three dollars put in yeah in other words the employer will put in half of what the employee puts in keeping in mind the employee can reduce the current pay taxable pay pay less taxes now and then the employer will match it the general thinking is that you try to um, contribute as much as possible to maximize the employer's share if you're an employee otherwise you're just wasting this amount that potential amount the employer could put, be putting in for you whenever you hear the term Roth that implies there is no immediate deduction to the employee the benefit of a Roth is that it's not going to be taxed when you have a qualifying distribution typically a qualifying distribution means you had a Roth account for at least five years and you're gonna take the distribution after your age 59 and a half if you take the distribution out early possibly the earnings not the contribution remember you got no deduction for the contribution but the earnings in the Roth account could be taxable and if you take the distribution out uh, before age 59 and a half not only is it going to be taxable but there's going to be a 10 percent penalty on those earnings for an early distribution again hear the term Roth no deduction up front by the employee the benefit is uh, tax-free when you take the money out if you're a corporation and maybe wants to save some money but you want to have a retirement account what you can contribute into the retirement account is not money but stock of the company and distribute that out as a benefit to the employees so there's requirements especially for a option plan a stock option plan typically um, a employee will be given a granted a stock option and at the time they get a grant to buy stock in the company they have to pay whatever market price it is at that time just like the general public has to pay the market price at that time but the option let's say it's a hundred dollars here and that's the grant you have to buy the stock at this price 
and right now everybody can buy it at this hundred dollar market price but hopefully the market price will increase but the stock option still says you can buy it at a hundred dollars okay so the difference here between the hundred you're buying it at the market price is the value of owning this stock option now you don't own it yet until you exercise you buy the stock uh, exercise and you're gonna pay a hundred dollars even though maybe the stock has gone up to five hundred dollars now once you make this exercise there's some income realized for not the regular income tax but for alternate minimum tax AMT that I believe we'll talk about in a future chapter okay you still own the stock you may have to pay this AMT tax now later on hopefully more than a year after your exercise you sell hopefully the price has gone up yeah like maybe six hundred dollars and your cost basis is what you paid for over here and because you held it for more than a year this five hundred dollar profit is a long-term capital gain like we saw tax at lower rates in past chapters again the incentive to the employer is that they can use their own stock maybe they can contribute cash to buy their stock yeah especially if they want to have a stock buyback program to buy treasury stock and you're having uh, the employee put in some money but that some money is later on hopefully after the stock has increased in value and increase some more before they sell it okay stock options that was for cooperation but for partnerships for sole proprietors self-employed taxpayers again you can have that keel type plan and there's a dollar limit of how much you can contribute for any one employee especially the owner employee that's 54,000 per year contribution now and there's a formula for a lesser amount up to and and our textbook shows it in a footnote that it's 20 percent of the business profits can be contributed up to 54,000 for the owner of the business now again you have to cover employees also with something comparable so sometimes uh, small businesses would hire through professionals employment services so those are technically not their employees but the employees of the uh, that third party who have to cover them with their own benefits there's simpler type of uh, self-employment plans called SEP and simple simple yeah and basically you can go to most financial institutions and they have a department for retirement plans and they can give you these uh, um, rules and r r rather simple to set up now if you have a complex situation you should probably be approaching professional retirement planners that can help uh, maybe even be your trustee in the case of a retirement plan let's talk about uh, employee sponsored plans versus employer again we're talking IRA individual retirement accounts this Coverdell account is sometimes called an IRA now if you want to save for education higher education the better way to do that is through something called a section 529 educational savings account which is more flexible and you can put in more than I believe the 2000 mentioned for Coverdell IRAs We'll see this uh, 529 account, I believe, in our chapter 14, the last chapter of the semester. So there's two flavors of IRAs. The traditional has been here for decades, and the Roth may be a couple decades old. The benefit of a traditional generally is that you can get an upfront deduction when you make the contribution. The benefit, and it's all going to be taxable probably if that's the case when you take the money out distribution. In the case of Roth, remember every time I said Roth, there's no deduction. The benefit of a Roth IRA is when you take a distribution, that's probably going to be tax-free. 
So here's a table that shows three rows. Really, these two rows are the same thing. It's traditional IRAs, one that's not deductible when you make the contribution, and one that is deductible. Keeping in mind, a traditional IRA could be both at the same time, partially non-deductible, partially deductible, or fully non, or fully deductible, versus the Roth. Again, Roth, no deduction. The benefit of the Roth is tax-free when you take a distribution. The dollar limits of how much you can contribute each year is the same. It's uh, 5500 for uh, each taxpayer. And if the taxpayer is age 50 or older, another 1000 totaling 6500 for the year. There are income limitations for contributions. You have to have at least 5500 to make a 55 of income to earned income work income to make a contribution of 5500 i had a client one time trying to contribute money for their kid who wasn't working can't do that the kid has no earned income yeah you have to have at least this amount of work income to make this amount of contribution for the year now if you have a spouse who's not working as long as the main taxpayer has work income you can use that work income as an income limitation to contribute to the non-working spouse. Um, limitations, other limitations besides the income limitation, there's a work, it, this is really again a earned income limitation. Now there is a AGI limitation, the total income limitation. In the case of non-traditional, there's no phase out. As long as you have this amount of work income, no matter how much you make after that, there's no limitation. But there is a limitation to be able to deduct based upon the taxpayer's AGI if that taxpayer, here the, employ, um, the employee, works for an employer that has a pension plan, a, pro, a retirement plan. Again, if the employee is covered by the employer retirement plan then there is going to be an AGI limitation of this deduction okay, it's going to be phased out uh, often I can't tell you the dollar amount but it's uh, um, roughly 50 60 hundred thousand dollars depending upon the filing status if you're below that AGI limit you can deduct the whole contribution if you're above the AGI uh, total phase out limit no deduction you still can contribute, but no deduction. And if you fall in between the range, it may be partially deductible and partially non-deductible. If you don't get to deduct it, then eventually when you take out the money, this non-deductible contribution will come back tax-free. Here, if you did take a deduction, then everything you take out will eventually be taxable because you have a zero basis. Everything was deducted. Here you got to deduct, uh, not deduct, so you have a basis. What you see more and more becoming popular is the use of a Roth IRA versus a traditional IRA. Again, no upfront deduction, same contribution limits. If you have both a traditional and a Roth, the total contribution for the year combining both together is this 5,500 or 6,500 if you're age 50 or older. Again, the benefit here is that for Roth is that tax you get tax-free distributions if it qualifies. Qualifies meaning, again, um, having this Roth IRA for at least five years and taking it out distribution after age 59 and a half. Now, there is an AGI limitation for contributions into a Roth. If your income exceeds a certain high limit, the contribution starts to phase out, okay? even though you have no deduction. How can you tell whether an employee is covered by an employer's retirement plan? You look at the employee's W-2 form, and if they're participating in an employer retirement plan, you'll see this box checked off here, retirement plan. Keeping in mind, that applies to this deduction here. If the employee has a traditional IRA and makes a contribution 
and if you're exceeding certain AGI limits, maybe you cannot take a deduction. You still can contribute, but no, no deduction if you exceed that limit. Here's an example where we have a married couple and one spouse is working or has very little income and, the, and you can use the income of the other spouse. John and Abigail, they're doing a joint return. They each can contribute 5,500 to their own IRA. You cannot have a joint IRA. Each taxpayer would have to have their own IRA with a maximum of 5,500 contribution each year. I believe this um, dollar amount is uh, adjusted for inflation. So if as long as one of the spouses earns 11,000 for the year, you can use that income to um, reach the limit for the other, other spouse that may either have lower income or no income. So in this case, if the joint couple has 8,000 total earned income, this is not AGI now, it's earned income limitation. They can use this 8,000 to divide up among the two spouses to fund their, um, their IRA contribution, as long as no spouse has more than 5,500. Roth, no deduction up front. The benefit is that you get um, this, they say here tax-free growth, but really it's tax-deferred. You really don't know whether it's going to be taxable or not until you have a qualified distribution. So I would say tax-deferred. Here, tax-free if you meet these conditions. After age 59 and a half, if you take a distribution before that, possibly the earnings that's being distributed, not the original contribution, is subject to a 10% early withdrawal penalty, okay? in addition to the regular income tax that you may have to report for those earnings. There are special rules if you inherit IRAs, be it traditional or Roth. Yeah? I come across this uh, not frequently, but I do come across it. I always have to refer back to the instructions. And the trustee of the Roth should know how to report and handle the distributions or the accounts for the beneficiaries of the uh, taxpayer that passed away. There are some exceptions to avoiding uh, penalties. Here you can take up to 10,000 from that Roth account and I believe avoid the early distribution penalty. Or here take it out totally if you become disabled. Here's that phase out range for again no deduction but phase out range for contributing in the first place into an IRA each year so if you're single and your AGI falls below uh, 118,000 you can contribute the full $5,500 limit if your AGI is above 133,000 then you can contribute zero not deduct uh, zero contribute zero remember there's no deduction for Roth and if your income AGI falls within the range here let's say halfway looks like it's uh, 15,000 total so another 7,500 then your limit would be half of this 5,500 contribution and different amounts for married filing joint this is a uh, maybe a, a planning technique here if you have money in a traditional IRA, you can transfer or roll it over into a Roth. Keeping in mind, taking money out of an IRA, traditional, could be a taxable event. If you have no basis in that uh, IRA, everything will be taxable, be it as a regular distribution or a rollover or transfer to a Roth. But when you do transfer to a Roth, you avoid that 10% early withdrawal penalty. So let's say you have a Roth IRA and you're over these limits here. So you cannot make a contribution. What you should do if you don't have a traditional, and this will be good if you already if you do not have a traditional, is to set up a traditional and fund it with that 5500 
and maybe because you're uh, an employee covered by an employer retirement plan, you cannot deduct this. So you have now have a basis of this 5,500. What you do is you roll it over right away. And the value compared to this is what's going to be taxable. And if it's the same amount, there's no tax. And now you get to put money into that Roth, even though you exceed the, uh, the uh, threshold amounts here. So this is, would be a backdoor for contributing to a Roth IRA. So when you do get money out of the retirement account here coming from this financial institution to you, each year you'll get a Form 1099-R reporting the total distribution and possibly the, the financial institution will tell you how much of that is taxable. Could be the whole thing. But if the, tax, if the financial institution doesn't know your basis in the retirement account, they may check off this box and say how much you had contributed of your funds and it leaves it up to the taxpayer or the taxpayer's tax preparer to figure out how much of this distribution is taxable. And there's different calculations for calculating whether it's a pension, profit sharing, 401k, an IRA plan of how much it is taxable. There's different formulas or different rules. There's different rules for state tax laws also. One of the important um, fields on this form is this box 7 and this neighboring box here. If you check this off, you know the distribution is coming from IRA and the IRA distribution formula would be used, which I'll show you in a second. The most common code you see here in box 7 is number 7. So in the back of one of the 1099-R forms, you will see the code letters here. 7 is a normal distribution, and you follow the regular rules versus early distributions, versus disability distributions, versus maybe inheriting a, uh, a retirement plan, and additional codes. You can have multiple codes in that field 7. So let's see how this is reported on a 1040 form. So here's our wage or salary reported to us on a W-2 form. And if you're participating in a contributory plan, possibly what's taken out of your paycheck is going to reduce the amount of your taxable wage or salary, which is good right now, right? You pay less taxes now. You're deferring the tax until eventually when you do retire and take distributions out of the retirement plan. Or if you have an IRA, here is a traditional IRA contribution being deducted here. Keeping in mind, no deduction for Roth, which is becoming more popular, I believe, than the traditional. If you do get that 1099-R, here is where you report the gross IRA distribution, gross pension, gross profit sharing, gross 401k distribution. And if they tell you how much is taxable on that form, you probably have to write it here or write it here. If they don't tell you how much is taxable, you have to go through a calculation that, to determine how much is taxable. If you have a basis that you can subtract out, then not the full amount will be taxable. We've learned about Social Security taxation in a previous chapter, but you can see the format is kind of similar. Gross distribution and how much is taxable here. If you're a self-employed um, business owner, a partner in a business, then you're going to have income from your Schedule C or income from your partnership K-1 form. And then maybe that will make you eligible to contribute to a retirement account. And you can take a deduction right here. Yeah? Reducing your income, paying less taxes. So ultimately, you get your taxable income and you figure out your tax. That includes maybe tax on your retirement income. Keeping in mind that if you take out an early distribution before age 59 and a half, in addition to the income tax, you pay a penalty tax. Where is it? Here, line 59. Yeah, on that early distribution that you add to your regular tax. And here's the form to calculate out that 10% penalty. 
Now there's exceptions, a um, couple pointed out in this slideshow and more so in the textbook, where you put in the code number here, you can avoid paying that 10% penalty if you meet those exceptions. Here's a form to calculate how much of your IRA is going to be taxable. Keeping in mind, if you do have a basis that you'll recover tax-free, it'll be tracked over here. And then based upon how much you took out during the year and how much is left over, you go through a formula to figure out how much of this basis you're using up for the year. And then any rest of the distribution from your IRA is going to be taxable that you report back on the 1040 form. This is a form you want to keep if you do have a basis, keeping track for the rest of your life how much you can recover tax-free. This is our last slide for this part two video lecture. We, I don't want to cover this too much in detail because it doesn't really apply that much to Hawaii, especially a so-called health savings account where you have to have also concurrently a high deductible health insurance plan. Because of the laws here in Hawaii, most employers have to provide their employees with health insurance if they work 24 hours or more a week. And the level of coverage is more than a high deductible plan. High deductible means the, the, the coverage here would be applicable to major medical costs like surgery, hospital costs. Regular doctor bills, very little will be covered. So it's part of the deductible the employee has to pay out of pocket. So where's the employee going to get this money from? Well, if they put money into a health savings account, now the, and it's going to be either deductible or tax-free if it's funded by the employer, now they can use that to pay off their deductible. Again, I've seen only a couple times this in Hawaii because of the rules for health insurance, it's not too uh, applicable. Okay, that's it for our video lecture for Chapter 9. Work on your uh, homework assignment. Contact me if you have questions.